Hello and welcome. We are the steering committee of the IPTRN, the International Polar Tourism Research Network. Uh, my name is Patrick, Patrick Bruder, and this is our host, uh, Edward Hoybens, here in Northern Iceland. We're very happy to offer you some food for thought on the polar tourism issues that you will be discussing in your Knowledge Cafe. And each of us has something to say about different areas of the polar regions. And we're going to begin with our host, Edward. Thank you, Pat. Um, we are here now in northeast Iceland in a small village called Raivarhub, which has been faced with population decline for the last couple of decades. Um, tourism has been pegged as a development option for the region, but we have been out, out here mapping the challenges of how to implement this tourism and how to sustain tourism growth in the region. There is no lack of ideas. There's always plenty of people and plenty of ideas floating about. What we're facing with is uh, lack of money, of course, to implement the ideas, lack of collaboration between individual entrepreneurs. We also have, in that very respect, uh, lots of uh, uh, management structures and ideas of site-specific uh, guidelines on how to, how to manage sites and how to build and develop sites. Um, they're all out there, but they don't have any legal standing. They don't have any um, role to play in, in, in the development uh, here. And this is something we need to rectify. As I say, we don't need to invent these, they are all available, we don't need to invent the management, we don't need to find the ideas, we just need to do them, and do them properly. So in terms of food for thought, uh, and also related to regulatory mechanisms, in the Yukon Territory in Canada, we have um, a Wilderness Tourism Licensing Act. And through that act, the Wilderness Tour Guides can, to some extent, um, control what uh, people on their own trips are doing, for instance, on a canoe trip. However, it's the self-guided trips where it gets a little tricky. So people can rent canoes and they're off on their own. And then it's a voluntary mechanism that kind of kicks in. Um, and on that note, I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Dieter. Thank you very much. Um, I can report a little bit from Northern Sweden and the European Union. I think there the biggest problem is actually the fact that a lot of tourism is nowadays organized in project form often lasting for three years or, or something like that, which implies that even governance is all the time in change. I mean, there are a lot of different stakeholders, there's no continuity, which is really a challenge in order to kind of accomplish a kind of a constant and re reliable development. Hi, my, my name is uh, Marti Lamers. In uh, the polar regions, yeah, yeah, tourism is, in, is in, increasingly governed by a collective, by, by collective self-governance self ar arrangements. This is all, 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 all very good, of, of, of course, re responsibility to, uh, to, uh, to uh, the tour operators. But what, what, what we also see is, is, is that actually these kind of, of, of arrangements are, 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 are increasingly uh, sort of getting tension and in, into conflict with uh, with with, uh, with 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 state regulators in in in, 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 in Svalbard, for example, they, they, they are there are now there there are now two databases there towards which uh, that two operators have to, have to report, and, the, and this is not the, the most effective way of dealing uh, with things. Hi, I'm Pat Mayer, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about governance, uh, management, and regulations in Nunavut in Canada. So recently, I've been involved with uh, Nunavut Marine Tourism Plan, and there we've we've realized that there's so many levels of regulation and governance that it's really confusing for tour operators to exist. They have, you know, different standards, ten different places they need to go, or more than that. And when they cross boundaries in Canada and over to uh, places like Svalbard or Greenland, as they do with cruise ships, they're crossing all sorts of regulatory boundaries. So there really is a lot of confusion for the tourism industry. Hi, uh, my name is Emma Stewart, and um, I've been interested in the South Antarctic Islands for a number of years now. And um, there are interesting locations, of course, they're traditionally gateway, um, gateways to the Antarctic. Uh, but more recently, of course, they've become quite important in terms of um, being destinations in their own right, but also um, being staging posts for the new modes of travel to the Antarctic with the, uh, the fly cruises, of course. Uh, but in terms of governance, it's very interesting because um, the jurisdictions are very different, of course, and we can't really talk about the sub-Antarctics as being a single entity from a governance perspective. Um, 
what we are seeing is uh, an increase in the number of larger cruise vessels to some of these locations. And for example, in the New Zealand sub-Antarctic islands, we're seeing potentially the world cruise ship visiting and others um, to these small remote islands. Um, as a result of this, we understand that the Department of Conservation in New Zealand is reviewing their conservation management strategy, uh, which may revise the quotas and permits for um, accommodating these larger vessels. Of course, this has implications for the existing tour operators, but also these new players um, navigating these new regulations and so forth. Uh, but also, um, it may have implications for regulation of, of vessels moving further south. I'm Daniela Liggett and I focus my research on Antarctic tourism regulation and aside from what Emma has mentioned already that we see indirect regulation through regulating tourism to the sub-Antarctic islands we also have to take into consideration that the International Association of Antarctica tour operators has an enormous impact on how tourism is managed in situ. They're in essence the managers of Antarctic tourism whereas the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Parties presumably take care of tourism governance through the Antarctic Treaty System, but only focusing on those operators that are based in countries that are signatories to the Antarctic Treaty. The problem is that the Antarctic Treaty Parties have not really shown a lot of political will to put tourism regulation in action and that in essence, tour operators themselves assume a lot of the management. Thank you very much for your attention and we hope you enjoy the rest of the Knowledge Cafe.